So this morning's title is called The Beauty of Acceptance. And I chose that song because, um, as you'll see from the talk, when we can get into this place of total acceptance, then we can do what that song suggests, which is always recognizing that there's so much beauty around us, even in really difficult times. If we look within that, we'll find something beautiful or something that can teach us something important. So um, actually, as I was driving across the Flint Hills this morning, I was telling some of you that I was, I'm listening to a book on tape. But it was so gorgeous, I just had to turn, turn it off so I could you know, pay attention to what was there. And I, I thought about the hills and how the earth is always so accepting. You know, those hills are just there. The Flint Hills is a perfect example. They're just there, lying open all the time, accepting rain, sun, the night sky, highways being built, cattle tromping over them, um, drought, whatever it is that comes, they're just there in this beautiful unfolding of acceptance and receiving. And regardless of what comes, I mean, sometimes there will be hardship in times of drought. For example, the earth will crack, but it still just is there waiting and, t and receiving whatever is coming. And then amazingly, even after years of drought, you know, as soon as it gets what it needs, from, from within, things start to sprout and grow. And how much we are like that, or we can be like that, to just be accepting and open to everything that happens. And when times of hardship are there, we're still opening, opening to what it is and accepting it, knowing that there is this eternal you know, spring of growth within us that, that will, will come back to life when that time is over. So I thought that was really, really beautiful. And last week, we're actually looking for a minister at our home church, and um, we started to have the ministerial candidates come in. <clears throat> and the speaker last week was Cherie Taylor-Jones, and uh, she spoke about acceptance, about accepting all that is. And so I wanted to just share a little bit of, of what she talked about to start this talk. And um, she was <laughs> sharing a story of something that happened with her. Um, where she was having a very good day. I think maybe she was preparing for the talk she was giving last Sunday or something, but feeling really good and everything's beautiful and everything's great. And she said she was in the shower, you know, getting ready for a meeting when suddenly she realized, a meeting with the senior minister where she is currently placed, uh, she suddenly realized that the meeting was starting right then. <laughs> and she's in the shower. So she said immediately she does what many of us do, and she calls it hopping on the bad train the bad train. So she said she has this, you know, she's on the express train, the express bad train, and stop number one, she said, is, I'm getting so old, I can't remember anything. And then, you know, she continues on, stop number two is, I'm so stupid, how could I do this? Stop number three is, I've blown my credibility with this minister, I might as well hang it up. You know, it's never going to work. So she said, you know, from there, she gets on the local train, and it says, um, instead of just that moment of I'm stupid, it transfers to this kind of general thing of I'm an irresponsible person, I'm not worthy of being a minister, I'm incompetent, there's just no way, I'm never going to be a good minister, so why am I bothering? So it's very interesting how this happens in our lives, right? As soon as we label something bad, all this other stuff starts to happen. So it's very, very limiting. We limit ourselves so much when we label something bad. So it might be a behavior of our own, but it also might be a behavior of another person, or just somebody's personality, or an event that happened somewhere in the world. But as long as we're labeling something that way, everything is suddenly in a little box that's in our head that says, this is what bad looks like. So this keeps us in this place of shame and guilt. So she was talking about how that works with her and that how she recognized that in that moment she could, you know, she, she went to that place and then she recognized how limiting that was going to be. And in fact, after this meeting with the minister, she, there was supposed to be a staff meeting. And she was talking about if she, if she stayed in that place of shame and guilt, she would have just skipped that staff meeting. She would have felt too, you know, shameful to go there. But instead she's like, no, I don't need to go there. I don't need to label myself. I can stand tall and proud and just recognize that I made a mistake. She can look at that mistake, that, that situation to see, well, what, you know, what did go on? What she got going on in her life that caused that to happen instead of it being something intrinsic within her that made her incapable. And she recognized that she was trying to do a lot of things at once. And when you have all those balls and juggling all those balls in the air, something is bound to drop. That's just a human thing that happens. So she was able to go 
to the, um, the meeting. You know, she freed herself to act and to be responsible in the world. And she was able to go to the meeting with her head held high, and she just told them all what happened. And they all laughed with her and said, welcome aboard. We've all missed some meeting with our senior minister at some point in our careers. So, you know, that just was affirming the fact that, you know, what happened was just human. It's just a human thing to make a mistake. And it reminded me of that beautiful quote by Alexander Pope that says, to err is human and to forgive divine. So that includes forgiving ourselves. Sometimes we think of forgiveness as always forgiving another person for some transgression. But it includes forgiving ourselves for whatever mistake we might have made or whatever mishap came along. And then, then we can look at the situation and really see, you know, what's my growth in this situation? What lessons are there within it? Then she went on to say that there's also danger in labeling things good. So sometimes in unity, you know, we're in this situation where we're like, oh, it's all good, everything's good. Right? But when we, when we also label something good, we set ourselves up for disappointment. Because it means we have certain expectations of that situation or that person or that ideology or whatever it is. And so, again, once again, we're limiting ourselves. Instead of really being like the prairie and just being open to whatever is happening, we start to get all kinds of preconceived notions about what that means and what that's going to look like. We also start to look ourselves outside of ourselves then. Whether it's validation of good or bad, we start to look outside of ourselves and we enter into this blame paradigm where we become reactive rather than responsive to what's going on in the world. And she talked about these situations, even just you know her giving the talk, how if she's in that mode, she's like expecting everyone, for example, to think, oh, I am the greatest speaker ever. I'm getting, you know, all of you are going to be thinking, I'm, I'm getting so fulfilled by all of this um, information that this great minister is, is giving. And then if you don't happen to have that point of view, suddenly I'm like, oh gosh, I suck. <laughs> right? <laughs> so instead, just let things be as they are. Everybody will have their own experience, their own opinion. That's not a reflection of how good or bad my talk even was. And I've certainly learned that as a musician. You know, sometimes I'm in a crowd and, I mean, I'm, I'm performing for a crowd, and especially this happens a lot in the Midwest, where people listen like this. Even sometimes a rousing fiddle tune, and they're like... <laughs> you know, I'm like, oh, okay, well, this isn't going very well. And then afterwards, they come up to me and say, oh, my gosh, I love that so much. So, you know, I've learned that I can't, I don't know what experience they're having. Or, or what's really going on with them, or whether they're liking it or not. It is helpful when there's a few smiling people. <laughs> that helps. And there always are a couple, and I kind of tend to, you know, zoom in on them because that helps me keep my energy up. But I know that those other people who aren't necessarily open to what I'm saying, or don't appear to be open, might actually be getting a lot out of it. But maybe they just don't have that capacity to, to let down their guard to show that they're really being open. Or maybe their personality is just different. Maybe they're shy. So, so that's really important, just not to judge that experience. <clears throat> so this acceptance becomes very freeing because suddenly we're free like the prairie to just allow everything in. So like this morning, we, it's nice to have this, it's beautiful to have this. But once again, if we're so attached to that idea that this has to happen in order for our service to work, we're going to feel disappointed all morning long, staring at the blank wall when we don't have those words up there that we're used to and that we want to have. Instead of just being in the experience and listening to what's going on or letting the words or the music or whatever or your neighbor's energy, you know, come to you. So it's a very, very freeing thing. And in fact, she started her talk by saying, peace comes from acceptance and freedom comes from peace. Peace comes from acceptance and freedom comes from peace. I thought that was really, really beautiful. So this acceptance does not mean that we always like or enjoy every experience. Obviously, there's some things that are very painful. Maybe something we did is causing us pain. Maybe something, the situation, is painful to, to witness. There are things that are very painful. Um, so it doesn't mean that you enjoy or like them. It means you accept what is happening for what it is without labeling and without passing judgment. And then we can be open. And I, don't, I can't recite this whole story. But, you know, there's that beautiful Chinese story about... Um, 
a man, I don't remember all of, all of the steps, but you know, a lot of different things kept happening. And for example, his horse became crippled and the, the village people all came to him and said, oh, that's so terrible, your horse is crippled. He said, well, I don't know. And then the next thing that happened is the, um, I think the army came through, or maybe it was his son who broke his leg, anyway. So the army came through and they couldn't conscript the son because he had a broken leg. And they were saying, oh, that's so fortunate. And he said, well, I don't know. And anyway, it went on like that. You know, there's always like the village proceeded as good and it turned out to be bad or, you know, or something less fortunate, it appeared to be fortunate, turned out to be less fortunate, but just went on like that, which is exactly what happens in life. Things go up and down and things come and go. And often we have a situation that happens that appears to be really terrible, a real tragedy and something amazingly beautiful comes out of it. So we are just here to experience life and to be open to it so that we can respond in some kind of compassionate way. And by not labeling, this really helps us do that, by not judging. The judgment removes us from that experience and from being able to do that. So I had a, a situation, actually a family, a family um, gathering. This was an invitation by an old family friend and her daughter who were gonna be in town. The daughter's about my age and I've actually rekindled an, uh, a friendship with her, um, kind of separate from my family, but the mother went to school with my parents and, and they were in town. We d they're, they're not in town very often, so they invited us all to a, a Sunday brunch and we're all happy to be there. And as, as the conversation goes, my sister, I don't remember actually quite how we got on this topic, but there was something, something said, I guess, about, about my I don't know, my, my countenance, my positive nature or something. And my sister said, oh, she's not like that. And so she recounted this story from when I was in my 20s, my early 20s. She, I was in Costa Rica, she was living with me, and um, she says that I, she, she didn't speak any Spanish, and she asked me some Spanish that she could say to the mother of a friend where she was invited for dinner. And according to her story, I told her something really, really rude, as a, like as a joke, right? <laughs> I can't, Im I do not remember that. <laughs> and I honestly can't imagine that I would have said that to her knowing that she was gonna say that to the mother of her friend. I mean, I might have said that to her in a joke, you know, to say to her friend or something, but to the mother of her friend, I'd already lived in France for two years. I understood the power, especially of curse words <laughs> in a foreign culture. So I can't imagine that that happened, but maybe it did, maybe it didn't. I don't remember it happening. I certainly would never say that today. But she was recounting this as a way to show that I was not the person that these other people perceived. And it was kind of said in a joking manner, but I also recognized that for some reason she wanted to bring me down. So, and you know how family stories go, right? And I also recognized that she perceived me in a certain way. Now my family was a family that had a, we were, we were constantly digging, you know, cutting each other with words and digging each other. And I know as a child, I perceived that as a game. It was like the way we did things in our family. I never intended harm, although I know that I caused harm. I was very good at it. I had a good wit and a quick mind. So I could come up with those things really fast. And for me, it was just that, it was a game. And it was also a way to protect myself. And I recognize now it was a defense mechanism that I had to deal with a family that was actually extremely critical. That way I, I wasn't hurt and I stayed on top. But not everybody else could do that. And she was probably one of those people who received you know, barbs from me, probably my whole family, that were painful to them, that were hurtful. Things that I would not say today. But in families, you know, we get in these patterns, right? And I, I recognized sitting there that she was still seeing me in that way. That that was her perception of me because that's how she came to know me when I was growing up. But the beautiful part of it was I didn't judge her for what she was doing. In the past, I would have. I would have argued with her. I would have said I did not say that. I would have criticized her for trying to bring me down. I would have done all kinds of things. Because we get in these patterns where we want to, you know, our ego is very active and we want to defend ourselves. So I felt actually quite fortunate that I didn't have to go there with her, that I could sit there at the table and recognize, oh, she perceives myself, me in a way that's not so, and oh, she must be in pain that she's wanting to like, you know, criticize me and bring me down. So I was talking about this with um, my spiritual um, and meditation mentor, 
And she was talking about how we get into these hooks, right? A lot of our relationships are like this. It happens in marriages and friendships and families where, you know, this is the relationship. We both got our barbs in the other person and we're just stuck like this. One person says something, you say something like this. So it's very hard to break those patterns. But when we develop awareness and acceptance, when we stop judging, we can let go like this. So when we let go, what happens over here? What's left? What's left? What's here that isn't here? There's all this space. There's all this amazing space within which we can now choose to act in a variety of different ways or to respond in a variety of different ways. So that's what happens with acceptance. This is let go, and we create freedom. And she reminded me of the Bodhisattva vow, which they take this vow saying that they're going to, you know, create a mind of enlightenment which, from which they can then act with compassion and loving kindness. But essential to the vow is that they are doing this for all sentient beings. They're not doing it so they can then be in some state of bliss. They're doing it for everybody, to liberate everybody. So when I'm able to do this, or any of us are able to let go like this, there's all this freedom for me to act, and there's also all this freedom for her to act. Now, she might continue to do her thing, but it's much harder to carry out. She's got to do both sides of it now. She has to make it move in both directions because I'm no longer involved. So it actually gives her the freedom, too, to perhaps let go. I don't have any control over that, but it gives her that freedom. So I just thought that was a really beautiful and visual for what that experience is all, of, all about. So in that situation there with my sister, I was able to kind of become this container that we all have the capacity to be for everybody at the table. So not only did I, did I not judge my sister for what she was saying, I didn't judge myself either. I knew, maybe I did say that, I really don't know. I don't know, I just know I don't remember it, and I would never say it today. But I don't know. So I was able to not judge myself and to recognize if I did say something like that, it was habits that I had formed that I have now let go of. Um, and I didn't judge my sister, and it also allowed the conversation to continue in a very friendly and loving way. I just kind of, you know, took it lightly and pretended like I had little devil horns and kind of, you know, went with the flow. And, and I said, but my angel wings are growing at the same time. And, you know, just make, it, make light of it. So I also had this experience lately, a musical experience, that was so, so beautiful and reminded me of this whole idea. And it was with Eugene Friesen. He is an American composer and cellist, amazing person. And I got to play in an orchestra with him out on the Flint Hills. Um, was that just last weekend? I think it was just last weekend on a Saturday night, really amazing, phenomenal orchestra, and he was the kind of the head person. And um, he did a workshop during the day on what he calls free improvisation. And so to start, he said, okay, um, here's the rules. There are no wrong notes. There's no wrong tempo. You don't have to be, have any particular level of expertise on your instrument to do this. All you have to do is listen and respond to the other person. So, and he talked about why, why those, are the, those are the rules. Because then we let go of all those judgments about our playing and what I can and cannot do and what I'm allowed to do and what I'm not, not allowed to do. So it's the same thing where this amazing space is created. And then he turned to me, I think, because he knew that I was in the orchestra and maybe had some kind of level of comfortable, you know, comfortability with my playing. And he said, so how about if we try something? So I got to do this free improv with Eugene Friesen. It was two minutes of bliss. It was so fabulous. But, you know, he, I have done some improvisation before, but I was also feeling a little intimidated by, you know, his level of expertise. But him saying that stuff really freed me, and I, I just stepped in. And it was this amazing, unfortunately, I don't have it on video. I wish I had it. But, um, yeah, I know. <laughs> two minutes. It was just like it all went so perfectly. We ended on this note together, and there we were. We just we could go and perform it any time. It was really amazing. So, so that was another example how in all, you know, in all of life we can apply this rule of just freeing ourselves and other people from all these expectations and rules that keep us bound up. Um, another amazing situation from my life, which I know I've talked about here, is my situation with cancer. When I first found out, of course, I was, I was freaked out. 
and just all over the place, freaking out. Um, and then at some point, I, I got angry and was really, one day in particular, I remember I was really cursing God and just so frustrated with all the things I could not do. And um, I just had surgery and I don't remember if it was before or after chemo and people had moved me into a different home, but there were all these boxes with, you know, stuff that I didn't even know what I needed to do with. My kitchen wasn't functional and I couldn't take care of anything. And I was very frustrated because I couldn't do this, I couldn't do that, I couldn't do the other. And um, a few days later, so I was thinking to myself, I think I even said, you know, who, why, who am I to deserve all this misfortune? And a few days later, something happened that was really miraculous that was a result of me having cancer, where I received um, an amazing gift from, from another person that I didn't even really know that well. And I remember thinking then, it was literally like three days later, who am I to receive all this grace? There were just all these gifts flowing to me from so many different people of all different kinds. And, um, and I thought, oh, wow, three days ago I was thinking, who am I, you know, who am I to receive all this misfortune? So once I was able to accept what was going on with me and just be in it, um, I was able to find peace. And in fact, I got into just lying in bed and not having to do anything. It was the first time in my life that I didn't have to do anything other than lie there and heal. I could, you know, watch YouTube, sleep, stare at the cracks in the wall, whatever. <laughs> and afterwards, not that I want to repeat, knock on wood, but there was a little bit of nostalgia afterwards when I, you know, had to start getting my life back together and going back to work and doing things. And it was like, oh, those were the days. <laughs> could just lie around. So, so there's really something amazing about accepting a situation, even one that appears to be very, very ugly. Because then we can find whatever beauty there is within it. And for me, it was just being able to, to decide my day. I mean, I, I couldn't be very active, but, you know, to really just relax and let go of everything other than taking care of myself. So all of these things bring to mind this one word, equanimity. And this is a word that's used a lot in Buddhism. And I found this definition online that I really liked. It says it comes from aquan, aqua, aquanimitas, which is the Latin word. Probably not saying that quite right. So aquas means even, and animus means mind or soul. So it means an even mind or soul. And the definition here says it is a, is, it is a state of psychological stability and composure which is undisturbed by experience of or e exposure to emotions, pain, or other phenomena that may cause others to lose the balance of their mind or ourselves. <laughs> we don't have it, right? And then this article went on to um, show how equanimity was perceived in different spiritual traditions, which I thought was so fabulous. And the first one was Vedanta, which is one of the six schools of classical Indian philosophy. Um, it says equanimity is equated to Brahman, the absolute reality. So there's three words, Brahman, Brahma, and Brahmin, <laughs> which have different meanings in um, Indian spiritual language. And Brahman is the supreme, the supreme reality, what we think of as God. So the absolute re reality, that which is boundless, pure awareness, devoid of ego. This is not viewed as a state of mind, but rather is said to be our true nature. When the sense of individual discrete identity is dissolved, one transcends the apparent duality and see, sees oneself in union with all and everything. So you can imagine if you're in this amazing place of just evenness of mind, where you're not buffeted about by all this other stuff, and able to see how we are one with everything, there's nothing to judge anymore. Everything is a part of us, and we are a part of everything, and it is a part of creation, and it, it just is what it is. And then they gave this quote from the Bhagavad Gita, this beautiful Indian sacred text, that says, by renouncing our limited identity, we can reveal our true nature, which is Brahman. When one is fully aware, one does not become attached to the world. Rather, one acts as a witness or seer. So I mentioned that ability to be a container. And I think that, for me, that's what it is. Just as it happened for that moment of grace there at the table with my sister, where instead of reacting like I might have in the past, I was able to just be a container for the conversation and take my ego out of it. In Christianity, we can think of the, the saying that 
Jesus said, I'm in the world, but not of the world. So of course he's here on earth, acting, doing whatever he needs to do. And he also had emotional reactions to things, right? He got mad in the temple. He got upset with people at different times. But at the same time, he was so tapped into the source that he could be at peace inside, even if he is you know, acting in certain ways. So it, the same is true for us. It doesn't mean we never get angry or we never have any um, passion about things. And in fact, there, there are words that are often used to relate to this in yoga philosophy. Dispassion is often used and um, detachment. And in the West, those, those words have certain connotations that don't really reflect the true meaning. So it doesn't mean you just sit by and don't care about anything. Not at all. The Dalai Lama is a good example. He remains you know, loving and kind towards all, but you don't think he's angry at the Chinese? He doesn't agree with what the Chinese are doing. He's fighting and leading the whole movement against what's happening because he believes that it's wrong. But he still has compassion for the Chinese and speaks to them with loving kindness, all the while that he's leading something, trying to end, end what they're doing. So in yoga, where John said I'm <laughs> like the yoga person. In yoga, um, they talk about this, you know, actually that is what yoga is about. It's about trying to let go of our ego and all of those veils that cover our seeing so that we can see our true divine nature within. And there's a beautiful sutra, Sutra 112, I'm going to say it in, in Sanskrit because it's so beautiful. Abhyasa vairagya abhyam tan nirodaha that means this is the state of pure stillness and it is attained through abhyasa which is consistent and steady practice and vairagya and this word vairagya is often translated as dispassion or detachment but it's also translated as freedom so it means when we can you know let go of our attachment to all of the things that are going on people's behaviors our own behaviors items you know whatever it is all these things that will come and go including our own bodies our own life then we can relax and be free and be, you know, at peace. And it goes on to say, the mind becomes clear and serene when the qualities of the heart are cultivated. These qualities are also referred to as the four sublime attitudes and include friendliness, compassion, cheerfulness, and equanimity, upeksha, equanimity, which is considered to be the most important by some. The practice of yoga is the commitment to become established in the state of freedom. So I love that it goes back to what um, Sheree Taylor-Jones said in the beginning, that through acceptance we find freedom. And, that, and then the sutra, the next sutra goes on to say that this, that complete liberation from the world of change that comes of knowing the unbounded self, when we reach that, then the obstacles that stand in the way of our spiritual progress disappear. So it's a really beautiful, beautiful idea. So when all of this happens, when even if, you know, most of us are not going to reach the state of the Buddha and be in that, that state all the time, but we all have those moments. We all have those moments which we call grace, where we're able to suddenly just see and not be reacting anymore. So we can recognize those, and when they happen, we can maybe, you know, because of our awareness, allow that to happen sooner the next time, or maybe those moments will last a little bit longer. That's our work. So the beautiful thing is, when we do manage to do that, we're able to live without judgment as the witness and the container. We're tapped into this deepest core of ourselves that is God within, and then we are truly free. So this is an ongoing challenge. There's always stuff coming up in our lives. I, I get to practice all the time. I got to practice again last night with my family. I can't say that I succeeded very well, but I was able to, re to recognize what I was doing even while I was having my little reactions and to think about how maybe I could do something different the next time, instead of just having an expectation that my parents would act differently than they've ever acted. <laughs> and how, you know, expecting them to be the ones who change. Maybe I need to change, or maybe we need to change the situation a little so that we can find a different way of, of being together. But the beautiful thing is we have all this information at our, at our fingertips and all these examples from all these different traditions that can help to guide us. So acceptance is a door to freedom. And it's always there for us, just waiting for us to step through. This is the beauty of acceptance. And so it is.